Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our full year 19 results presentation. Uh, conducted in a different format. You know, we have a cost drive. This saves about $12,000, and it will also save me the salary of an investor relation manager if it fails. <laughs> <laughs> um, usual disclaimer. Uh, and then we'll take you through it in the normal format. I'll give a little bit of a look at the highlights. Dorian will go through the detail. Uh, I'll do it in a way which describes the market and the business. Dorian will obviously take us through a uh, segment level. And then some uh, comments about the current market and our outlook. Uh, well, suffice to say, we've had a good year with every uh, financial measure on the improve. Uh, we completed the sale of uh, two assets in the year, uh, receiving uh, cash proceeds after tax of $390 million. Uh, that has put us in a great position with a strong balance sheet, uh, high quality renewable generation assets, and low cost operations, which has given the board confidence to affirm the uh, target dividend we mentioned at the half year of 39 cents for the full year, 23 cents for the final. Now, there'll be a theme through this presentation of you know, organizing ourselves for success. Uh, and also, uh, you will have seen in the year the unreliability and increasing cost of gas. Uh, and and you know, good planning or good luck we're now in a great position to take advantage of that. So, uh, you know, very comforting in my final results to be able to say that the company is operating well uh, with great financial returns, as you see on this chart, and uh, the real strong positioning with further geothermal development. Of course, uh, many stakeholders are important in that conversation. Uh, maintaining financial discipline so we can continue to show great EBITDA to cash flow conversion. Uh, again, an improvement in our customer advocacy uh, score going up to 26 in a period where with regulatory oversight, we managed to in release more products than we've ever done, uh, rebrand and reposition the organization. And we did that because we have safe and engaged employees. Uh, we had a 1.3 TRIFA in the year, which is you know the best we've had, uh, and engagement scores stay high. And as I mentioned, all of that sums to you know great cash flow conversion and an ability to be comfortable about increasing the dividend uh, to 39 cents a share. We expect to keep going on those measures. With a continued reduction in OPEX and CAPEX, uh, you'll note that the target is a little bit higher than uh, we would have foreshadowed last year. And although we refer to midpoint, our target is actually the lower end of the range, of course. Uh, suffice to say, the retail market is incredibly competitive. And with that regulatory oversight, uh, a fair bit of investment has gone in there this year which obviously changes the year-on-year -year trajectory. Uh, continued focus on safe net. Uh, the injuries we had in the year were very minor slips and trips, uh, and we obviously looked to zero for those, but you know, a continued safe organization. Uh, we look to build customer advocacy. You know, 26 is good, but the world-leading uh, organizations are in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and we'll keep progressing on that. And we strive for best in class uh, employee engagement. But all of that, as I've mentioned, you know, has allowed us to show that distribution trajectory uh, and uh, the FY20 target remains the same. A little bit on the market. 
there's obviously huge momentum behind decarbonisation and a great societal push and increasingly a policy and customer behaviour push. Uh, but the facts are the facts. Electricity demand has been flat for a long period. So as we think about uh, the future decarbonisation of New Zealand, we take that picture into account and look at the lower cost opportunity first, which is the substitution of gas and coal with geothermal, rather than wholly relying on that momentum behind decarbonisation. And again, we're reminded that you know we, we do have to keep the overall supply demand in balance when you look at a chart like that. A bit of a more short-term question uh, around hydrology. We did see uh, hydrology rebound in the South Island, I think, as we went through 17 and 18. We thought, oh my God, is this a systemic shift? Uh, but 89 years of data doesn't lie, and we've seen the uh, reversion to mean. Uh, and, you know, we can comfortably say that the cycle is restored. Uh, and, you know, although the South, the North Island had lower hydrology for a period, that has also started to come back. Uh, the big story in the wholesale market, of course, is not that normal uh, hydrology dynamic, but the effect of gas in the wholesale market. Increasingly important in our digitized world. Uh, the wholesale prices, you know, we had the normal noise of hydrology and we're all very familiar with that. But I think the big feature in the year was the impact of gas supply interruptions uh, and, and the prospect for gas supply going forward. Clearly with our portfolio with peakers and gas storage and very strong risk management practices, we were able to benefit from that in the year. Uh, I was predicting that we would see a quicker return to more normal uh, electricity prices, which we haven't seen which reflects that ongoing uncertainty, which, you know, from our perspective is pretty good because we will continue to use our gas storage prudently and our peakers prudently, and also perhaps take a little bit more exposure uh, to shorter term markets, i.e. spot and CFDs uh, over the next year or two. Uh, in terms of the operating businesses, you know, they work to, uh, uh, two standalone strategies, obviously laddered down from optimization of our business to deliver com strong cash flows. But we're all here to create sustainable value for New Zealanders and connected to our brand promise. That's about putting our energy where it matters. The customer business in the year uh, improved an awful lot of metrics I've mentioned customer advocacy, churn relative to market, and impressively, the number uh, of phone calls reduced uh, to drive a higher net back. Now, in the year with you know the regulatory oversight I've mentioned, which of course is not finalised yet, uh, we did accelerate some of our plans uh, and we delivered more products, uh, including prepay weekly fortnightly paying uh, and importantly the basic plan which is the removal of PPD for all customers over time uh, which all of that in itself uh, comes at a cost uh, but the team did a really good job to maintain cost to serve while delivering on all of those accelerated plans. Now, our plan was to have all of that product set and way of serving our customers in place over a couple of years. We've done it over a year. So that gives a bit of a tailwind to the metrics in the customer business going forward. The wholesale business, again, impressive metrics on safety and cash costs, uh, geothermal and hydro volumes, you know, pretty good, but that's mainly a hydrology story. Uh, the big story in wholesale, of course, is the unreliability and the increasing cost of gas and uh, historical insurance products. 
has meant that the importance of developing our geothermal business and developing it in a low cost way uh, has increased. Uh, so a lot of the effort in the year uh, was about that, which is of course virtuous because the more we do to reduce our cost of operations, which is shown in those figures, the more competitive the next development gets. But the wholesale business has sort of got two connected activities at the moment. One is that continued lower cost of geothermal. And we're talking about geothermal in a gas equivalent, which is, you know, four to five dollars a gigajoule. So you compare that to where gas and coal has gone in the last year. It's a pretty compelling activity for the team. Uh, but of course, the wholesale business is also managing what that means in the medium term uh, for the operation of our gas plant. But again, a great operational year, significant uh, cash cost reduction and, and foundation for the future. So with these opening remarks, which you know, were driven by a few technological pauses, uh, I'll hand over to Dorian and I'll come back at the end. Um, hello everyone. Um, well, there's uh, four sort of themes that are going to come out as I go through the operational and financial performance for Contact for FY19. The first is that, uh, as Dennis has said, it's been a very strong year in terms of uh, renewable generation, hydro in particular. Um, the second is we've seen a, uh, a material increase to the cost of thermal um, generation. Uh, and with thermal generation being uh, the, one of the key risk management tools for the industry, either directly or indirectly, and also the price setter for large parts of the year. It's not surprising we've seen sort of higher wholesale prices. Uh, we'd expect them to remain uh, elevated relative to um, historic uh, levels until we see more reliable and reasonably priced gas coming to the market. Uh, the third point, uh, again, Dennis has mentioned this, is around um, we haven't seen uh, tariffs in the retail space adjust to the higher cost environment. So we're seeing our margins being squeezed there. We do think that's probably indicative of what you're seeing around retail and electricity uh, across the industry more generally. And the fourth point, which is very specific to us, um, we do uh, have a relatively strong balance sheet now. So uh, if and when we make a positive investment decision on Tohara uh, in FY20, uh, we're sort of ready to go in terms of funding for that. Um, this slide I've got up here sort of talks about the uh, key statutory profit performance. It's a standard slide for us. We've gone up from $132 million to $345 million. The breakdown of that is $175 million of discontinued operations, which is rock gas. We made $10 million in terms of trading up until when we disposed of the business at the end of November. And then we made $165 million actually on the uh, disposal itself. Um, underlying, uh, non-underlying profit of $4 million. Uh, the largest component of that is the $5 million of profit that we made on the disposal of the OGS asset, which takes you to our sort of underlying uh, profit of $166 million, which is up by $56 million on the corresponding number from the prior year. Um, the majority of that growth has come from EBITDA, and it's driven by a lot of the same things we talked about at the half year, you know, good renewable generation, and the ability to leverage our flexible uh, asset base so that when um, the market required additional volume in October and November, we were able to use our gas stored in the ground to push thermal harder. We were able to push our geothermal plants harder and indeed even defer our Wairaki for your inspection into December. So that's pushed up the EBITDA. We've seen depreciation being lower. We don't depreciate assets that are held for sales. There's a $3 million uh, benefit from that. But then we are, we have seen a sort of lower capex environment over the last few years. We see that feeding through in terms of appreciation. Interest rates, interest costs, net interest costs are lower by $14 million. You'd expect that we've got $477 million less net debt uh, year on year. And tax has gone up. Uh, you'd expect that in line with high profits. Our effective tax rate is marginally above the statutory rate, which relates to some permanent uh, timing differences. On to the um, performance of our uh, underlying um, of our continuing businesses from an EBITDA perspective, you can see their very strong performance in terms of the wholesale business. Uh, and that performance is, is uh, achieved even though uh, all things being equal, our costs have gone up uh, by $12 million because of the arms length arrangement we've now got with AGS and gas stored. And what's driven the, um, uh, the improvement in profit there is 752 gigawatt hours of increased uh, hydro generation. If you price that on a marginal cost of thermal generation, which is what that hydro displaces, that's worth $55 million of additional profit. 
the increased length that I talked about uh, at the right times uh, into the higher price environment also drove some benefits. We have had some headwinds. Um, the constraints around natural gas have been a uh, headwind for us. It has meant that we've had to apply more generation as a risk management tool, whereas in the past we would have been using um, more thermal to, to, to do that. Um, in terms of the customer business, that's come down by $9 million. That's a bit of a switch from the first half of the year uh, where the customer business EBITDA was actually up. And this is all about what I call price cost recovery. Uh, are your prices going up enough to recover cost inflation? And you can see it clearly on the chart here. They're not. Um, price effect is $8 million in relation to higher tariffs, but we've seen the cost inflation for networks and for electricity going up by $14 million. So there's an under recovery sitting there. Uh, there is a transfer price involved with this from uh, electricity in, from our wholesale into our customer business, but that transfer price reflects the same price that a prudent independent retailer would be seeing who's hedging their volumes uh, out uh, from, from three years out. So I guess what I'm saying here is uh, we think this is probably indicative of what you're seeing across retailing uh, electricity across New Zealand. So I'll now move on to the wholesale business. I've got a few slides to take you through that. Um, First one is around uh, generation costs, which have risen by $30 million, even though we've had those um, higher renewable volumes. And that is about higher acquired generation costs because we're having to use acquired generation as a risk management tool. And also because there's some profit benefits there. We like to buy low and sell high. So we've been able to uh, make a spread on some of our uh, acquired generation purchases. Um, we're also seeing those higher thermal costs flowing through here as well. If you uh, look at our uh, sort of individual asset performance, uh, hydro, you know, very strong. We've talked about that. That's the difference between a wet year uh, and a dry year. And uh, the timing was obviously very good in terms of those uh, offsetting those natural gas supply constraints that we've had. If you look at geothermal, the volumes there are down by 67 uh, gigawatt hours uh, year on year. Uh, that reflects the Wairaki four year inspection. Um, because we have to bring that plant back online slowly to ensure that the bioreactor is working properly uh, and the bacteria come back to life because that ensures that we comply with our consent, consenting onto the Waikato River. Whenever you bring a plant back online slowly, you lose a bit of efficiency. So that's what's driving that 67 gigawatt hours. The good thing is it's a normal occurring topic. So we go back to normal in FY20. We've had a, a, a positive and a negative also within the geothermal, uh, the Carapiti incident, which uh, has been talked about in lots of other forums. I'm not going to go into detail around that, but that cost is 30 gigawatt hours of, uh, of generation. However, that has been offset by the fact that we've strategically invested more money in well workovers, and that's allowed us to get more generation out of Ohaki. So from a thermal perspective, volumes are down just under 400 gigawatt hours, uh, and that relates to the natural gas constraints we've seen. We have seen, I mean, being very honest, we have seen peak uh, reliability in FY19 being an issue. Hasn't impacted us financially because we haven't had much gas and we've had shed loads of water. Um, but obviously the peak is a key part of our um, asset portfolio and we need, and we will have them operating reliability, uh, reliably going into FY20. Um, of course, that's something slightly negative there. I mean, something very positive is the great job that the uh, team have done re-engineering TCC over the last couple of years. Now, so it can now operate at a turn down level of 170 uh, megawatts. So that means at a, at a reasonable heat rate. So we're actually able to turn it down overnight now uh, when wholesale prices are lower. But it has also meant we've been able to enter into a tolling arrangement with a gas producer where we can use the gas producers volume of space load for the plant, and that then allows us to put our own gas through using TCC as a quasi peaker, introducing more operational flexibility to our operations and also improving our financial performance. So just on those thermal costs that I mentioned, you can see here on the slide, um, thermal costs are up by $8 million, even though volumes are down by 21%. And that's driven by um, marginal cost of thermal generation, so carbon and natural gas push our um, cost per megawatt up from 60 dollars to 74. So you've seen surrender rates at 100 percent. You've got a higher unit cost of carbon now and you've also got higher unit costs of uh, natural gas flowing through. So in terms of our wholesale contracted revenue, um, that's up by 37 million dollars. <coughs> we've, we've had upstream, but we've acquired and produced more volume so we have to sell it. So there's some volume here and also we've got higher pricing flowing through. Here. I just wanted to talk though about the channel switching that's going on. 
we've uh, we switched volume out of the CNI channel into CFCs. That's deliberate. It's a risk management um, uh, tool. Whilst we've got a level of uncertainty around the amount of natural gas that's available, uh, and therefore what our thermal generation is going to be and our cost of energy into the future, future is going to be, it's sensible to limit our exposure to longer term fixed price um, contracts, which is the CNI um, business. So we've been uh, haven't been recontracting and instead pushing that volume into short term CFDs, and some of it has gone into increased length with the grid. In terms of pricing, um, cut pricing into the customer business has gone up uh, based on the transfer price, the arms length transfer price. Issue is you'll see that the customer business hasn't been able to recover that fully from its customers, so its margins are being squeezed. CNI uh, pricing has remained flat. Now we took a lot of questions on this at the half year. Um, the reason why it's remained flat is because we haven't been recontracting, therefore repricing volume in the higher um, uh, higher wholesale priced environment. Uh, for the risk management reasons that I talked about previously. Where we are seeing higher prices, it, it's in those short-term CFDs because they are linked to ASX um, pricing. Uh, and you can see that coming through here. Uh, just to round off the slide, you can see uh, other net income is up um, by $10 million. A lot of that is around market making. We do see ourselves having a level of uh, in-house expertise on this. So we look to make some money in it. We do need to make some money because with the new prudential requirements of the ASX uh, with being more conservative, we've actually got $17 million of prudential uh, now, which has an opportunity cost and therefore we need to be making money on market making to offset that. So it's good to see that coming through. In terms of our trading performance, trading with the grid, um, it's up by, wait for it. $60 million, uh, big number. Um, and what that's been driven by increased length. So we've got 266 uh, gigawatt hours of increased length and the pricing that we're getting on that length is uh, $142 per megawatt. So whilst we're not seeing price increases in CNI, we are seeing price increases that I've shown on the previous slide in short-term CFDs and in our length that we're getting in terms of trading with the grid. Uh, that price increase in length is $53 per megawatt up uh, year on year. Uh, location losses have gone up by $20 uh, million. You'd expect that because that's proportional to the higher wholesale price environment. On the slide, you can see our location loss spread. Our LWAP, GWAP has moved slightly against us from 6.7% to 6.9%. You'd expect that with less North Island um, generation due to the natural gas constraints. So um, that's the wholesale business. I guess there's a, a, a lot of topics that have come up, uh, up around uh, uh, that have linked to, to natural gas in particular. I guess the comfort that I get around this is in the year we've been able to risk adjust our business for that and still get, deliver a strong financial performance. So on to the customer business now. And uh, we're seeing revenue down by $12 million in spite of tariffs going up a bit. Uh, and that's driven by volumes being down 3%. So average customer numbers is down by 2% and consumption per customer is down by 1%, which is following that sort of long, longer term uh, trend that you have there. Um, our customer numbers actually improved in the second half of the year. So if you compare June 19 with June 18, they're only down by 1%. Uh, what does that mean in terms of our EBITDA? It's down by $9 million. And this is about that price cost under recovery I mentioned. You can see this on the chart. Our electricity tariff is up by $2.10 per megawatt. The network uh, costs, uh, electricity network costs are up by uh, $1 per megawatt, and our electricity costs are up by $2.80. So you can do the maths there. You've got $3.80 per megawatt in cost inflation, yet only uh, $2.10 in terms of tariff increase. So you've got $1.70 under recovery. You apply that to 3.6 terawatt hours, it gives you about $6 million of profit and cash reduction. The rest of the variance is down to the lower volumes. You can see that the business has done what it can around its um, controllable lever around other operating expenses. It's got that down by a million from 82 to 81, but that's not offset, uh, not, not enough to offset that major price cost under recovery, which does talk to the competitive nature of the industry. Um, as this is a key point for us, uh, I have got a slide just to sort of uh, go into a bit more detail around this. So our customer business is facing some headwinds, as, as I believe the uh, industry is uh, more generally around, around this topic. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a construct of our uh, average electricity tariff. 
broken down between the cost that it's recovering and then the profit that we're making. And you can see really actually the largest component of the retailing electricity is basically just a tolling business to collect uh, network costs and pass them back to the to the lines companies. And the issue you've got is that, is that cost is going up on average by 2% every year. The next biggest component is electricity costs. And whilst those have remained relatively flat in this higher wholesale priced environment, we're starting to see costs in FY19 and 20 go up. So now uh, we're forecasting that's going to be uh, increasing by 2% on a compound aggregate growth basis. Yet the tariffs are only going up by 1% due to the competition. Customer business has done what it can with its lever. Uh, cost to serve or operating costs, as it's shown there, is down by 3% every year. So that's, that's a good result. But that's not enough. And you're seeing EBIT, the margin there, being squeezed. And it's coming down by 12% on a compound aggregate basis. And what does that mean in absolute terms for uh, the profit that we're making from electricity retailing? Uh, we're coming down from $34 million in FY16 to just a full cost of $19 million in FY20, which is a 2.2% EBIT margin. Um, great for consumers. You can see the average revenue from electricity that we're getting per customer is dropping by 1% every year. Uh, that's on a nominal basis, on a real basis. It's dropping by uh, 3% a year. Uh, and this talks to the uh, competition in the marketplace. You ask anyone how uh, competition manifests itself, and it's the inability to recover cost increases from your customers, which is what you're seeing here. Um, it's not sustainable, though, in the long run. So what we've been doing is making sure we have the lowest cost to serve, uh, at least within the tier ones within the industry, and that we have a flexible IT platform. And we've tested that by rolling out broadband on it. So when there is a move to increase scale or even some uh, cross industry convergence plays happen, we're in the best position to maximize the value from that for our shareholders and also uh, uh, push the uh, uh, customer experience for our customers. That sort of segues quite neatly onto our other operating costs, which are have continued their downward trajectory uh, of reducing by 5% on a compound aggregate growth basis down from $223 million to 212. The, um, I've split it into the sort of four key drivers, structure and performance is around the costs that disappear when we dispose to rock gas and AGS. Performance is around higher bonus costs because the financial performance of the business was, uh, was strong. So there's nothing you can do about that category. But the underlying uh, movement is down. We've had wage and salary inflation coming through there at $2 million. But there's some good high quality cost savings coming through here. And when I say high quality, these are cost savings that when the business tells me it's delivered something, I can actually track the initiative and see the benefit in our PL and in our cash flow. So I know that these have actually flowed through. So these are topics like within ICT, we've been um, outsourcing more of our applications into the cloud, saving us money. We've introduced configuration management databases, which allow us to optimize our systems, applications, and save on license fees. The wholesale uh, operations team has become leaner, uh, saving on some people costs. We've got procurement um, savings across multiple other categories. Uh, and we've got this lower cost of bad debt, which has come down by $3 million year on year. So good quality savings, good to see those come through. We have uh, decided to accelerate some investment. So we've invested $3 million more in our uh, brand uh, digital automation and product development. And we are already starting to see some digital savings in the year in terms of our OPEX associated with that. So that's pleasing to see. Uh, and we've invested $2 million, as I said previously, in terms of well workovers, which have uh, increased our geothermal generation. You see the benefits of that in our gross margin. Being very open and honest, not everything has gone according to plan, and we're seeing costs going up uh, uh, by a million in terms of broadband, which is an opportunity to learn and improve. Uh, lots of positives around broadband, customers like it, 12,000 customers already at the end of the financial year, tested um, our brand and our IT stack with an electricity and gas product, but we had thought we could leverage our fixed costs, uh, and we haven't been able to do that as much as we thought. Uh, so we have seen more staff come on. So we're working through how we optimize processes around that to get the costs back down again. So on these uh, uh, investments that we made for um, going forward in OPEX, so um, 3 million, as I said, has gone into brand, automation, digital product development. And how we're actually seeing that is we've launched five uh, new products or billing variations, which as Dennis said, is more than we've ever done uh, in the past. Um, 
we, in terms of the bidding variations, we don't think there's a coincidence around the fact that we've got the uh, uh, record low age debt associated with that and also a record low cost of bad debt. So we're making it easier for our customers to pay their bills. They're getting into less financial dis difficulty. It's a virtuous circle. We then incur less costs. So that's good to see that happening. The other indication that customers like it is we have seen customer numbers go up from an electricity perspective by 2% on an annualised basis in the second half of the year. In terms of those digital journeys uh, around things like processes around moving house, uh, paying bills, um, we can see the benefits of those coming through because if you actually strip out the increased calls into our call centre uh, for broadband to get an underlying view, we are seeing the number of calls coming down, which is directly proportional to our cost of service. So it's good to see that. So we will continue to work on that. We need to continue to demonstrate the benefits to our customers uh, around uh, digital channels so that we that you get the behavioural change and more and more of them switching to these cheaper channels for us and then you'll start to see real uh, reductions in the cost of service associated with that. And then in terms of geo, geo, uh, geothermal refuelling, so of that $2 million investment, in Ohaki that increased our re-injection capacity at one of our wells which allows us to produce 30 gigawatt hours more uh, in the year. A uh, great piece of business because based on $100 per megawatt wholesale price, that's $3 million of profit for a $2 million investment. Um, but the bigger picture here is you can see the cost of well workovers is coming down here drastically. We do see ourselves as being a global expert in terms of geothermal and managing uh, steam fields. So it's good that we are developing this IP uh, and reducing our costs of maintaining our steam fields. This will serve us very well with the Tohara business case because it means the actual cost of maintaining the fields is coming down and the profitability and the return on that business case will go up. In terms of our cash flow performance, uh, it was a strong year. Uh, operating free cash flow is up by 40, driven by that uh, strong EBITDA. This is on a uh, total business. Previously, I was talking about a continuing business. Um, did want to just call out the fact that trade working capital has gone up which is uh, bad from a cash flow perspective. You were probably expecting it to come down because we've net extracted uh, gas from the ground and our inventory has dropped by 15 million a year. This is because our accounts receivable has gone up. Uh, we were previously securitizing some uh, receivables, $8 million of that, um, for financing purposes. I've stopped doing that because there's more effective and efficient ways of financing. And also we had a very strong uh, June uh, 18 uh, from a wholesale perspective, so they had a large receivable with the NZX, which has been paid, and we had a good cash rate performance in July 19. So we understand that, uh, and there's, there's no issues around our trade working capital. Uh, lots of proceeds from uh, asset sales and disposals, which bring our free cash flow up to three, uh, 731 million. In terms of how we've used that, uh, if you look on the right hand side, uh, dividends paid in the year uh, have gone up from 28 cents to 35 cents, so we're sharing the value with our investors, which is good. You can see a major pay down of debt, which is great because that's creating the headroom that we require if and when we do uh, the Tohara um, project. Um, you can see the cash that we're holding is going up. Some of that is linked to the higher uh, ASX credential. Some of it is just linked to an arbitrage or uh, benefit that you're actually better uh, holding your cash deposits in terms of rate these days than uh, paying down some of your shorter term, uh, shorter term debt. We've also done a little bit of M&A. Uh, we've invested uh, 7.5 million from a cash perspective in terms of simply energy to drive our decarbonisation strategy and we're putting capital into uh, dry links carbon. So on to our dividend, uh, sorry, on to our balance sheet. Um, as I said at the start, you know, it is a robust balance sheet. You can see the net debt dropping by 477 million. Our average uh, interest rate has popped up a little bit to 5.59%. This is just a function of when all those proceeds came in, you have to pay down your flexible debt, which tends to be the bank debt, which is the cheapest. So that's just a mixed thing. In terms of uh, maturities of bonds, we've only got one coming up in FY20. I guess the key story here uh, is our net debt to EBITDA. Um, is dropping, and uh, with the announcement that came out recently with uh, Todd's um, signing up to uh, a long-term contract for storage on AGS, we've had agreement from S&P that they will no longer capitalise that onto our balance sheet anymore. So that uh, snapshot at 2.1 uh, for FY20 is where we expect the S&P measure uh, to converge into the future. 
which is great because that gives us that headroom. Uh, we want to remain within the triple B S and P band, so we want to stay below um, 2.8, which will roll within that. On to our dividends. So um, no surprises here. Uh, 39 cents. Just just recapping on this, we've now got a balance sheet which allows us to protect our investors from. Um, hydrology and variations in our stay in business um, capex. So um, there's no second guessing whether we're going to do a share buyback or a special dividend or anything like that. It is 30, 39 cents. The only time um, um, the dividend we've got to change the dividend would be around uh, if there's a structural change within our business. You know, for example, we do Tohara, there's in increased EBITDA and offering free cash rate coming in associated with that. Uh, or uh, I have to caveat it that you know our board obviously reserves the right to change our dividend policy. Um, so um, it won't surprise you, um, also because Dennis has said it already, that our uh, um, final dividend for uh, uh, FY19 is going to be 23 cents. Uh, it's imputed at 65%, uh, which is 15 cents. So that brings the total paid and declared dividend for FY19 up to 39 Sense. The details around the dividend in terms of record date and uh, payment date are on the slide. Great to see that positive uh, upward trajectory in the dividend and also the amount of operating free cash that we're paying out. It's up 82% for FY19 for paid and declared. The reason why it's not 100% remember is it wasn't a mean hydro year. It was a far better than mean hydro year, so we haven't paid out 100% uh, expectation next year because we're only uh, early, early into the year is it will be a mean hydro year and therefore dividend of 39 cents will be 100% of our operating free cash rate. So with that, I'll hand back to Dennis. Okay, so we presented a couple of slides at the half here as to uh, you know, near-term priorities and medium-term priorities, and I define medium as everything after six months, which is increasingly a redundant statement for myself. Uh, <laughs> But on the near term uh, priorities, we did uh, contract gas. Uh, clearly, there's a contingent element to some of that gas, and that's why the tick is a red tick rather than a green tick. Uh, you'll have seen the concept consulting report that came out in draft form last week on the uh, future supply demand for the gas market. They've got a few scenarios in there, but Suffice to say, the next couple of years are going to be driven by a little bit of uncertainty in the gas market, which, when it comes to the longer term priorities, you know, is probably pretty good for us. Uh, but what that means is that we have to manage that wholesale volatility in the uh, short and medium term. We've done that through a reduction in fixed price sales. Uh, you've seen the price differential we've achieved on spot and uh, uh, CFD sales. Uh, the outlook numbers we give uh, assume a pretty benign environment where we don't get any upside from uh, the uh, volatility in the wholesale market. And as you've seen from previous presentations, we're pretty good at protecting our downside. Uh, so there's some work to do over the next we while on how do you balance uh, short-term availability of gas versus your risk management position. As I say, our outlook figures are all driven on a pretty benign basis that we sell what we've sold and we don't capture any upside from that. In terms of customer, uh, clearly a big year. Uh, I think the uh, continued delay in the, reduce, in the production of the electricity price review tells you something, but that's not stopped us getting on with the job. Uh, as Dorian mentioned, five new products, including a very uh, smooth delivery of no PPD for new customers and a conversion of a lot of our uh, existing customers already to the basic plan. Now, the broadband numbers are actually pretty impressive. We're now at 12,500 customers. Uh, now is the time to put the right service and fulfillment model behind it. We've taken no risk on that so far. We've now got comfortable that broadband does deliver loyalty, it does deliver lower cost, and now what we have to put behind it is a different fulfillment model, which will see it turn profitable pretty quickly. Uh, 
Yeah, which is in itself, you know, three years after launching something to be showing uh, free cash flow on its own is is pretty impressive. Um, cost and efficiency program. Obviously, we hit the top end of our range uh, this year, rather than the bottom end, which has been our history. A little bit of uh, uh, bonus uh, accounting for some of that, but the big year in terms of getting ready for geothermal and. Uh, having the customer business uh, deliver what it's deliver, uh, so it's not unsurprising. Uh, gas storage, early next year, it'll be fully expanded. Uh, the new user obviously is useful from a uh, S&P perspective, but the real value in my mind is having more deliverability out of that facility, uh, and that will obviously be important if gas is going to continue to be unreliable and more expensive. In terms of the longer term, on decarbonisation, uh, as I've mentioned, there's two thoughts in our mind. One is the substitution of, wait for it, of existing uh, supply, and that is very much simply a uh, TCC versus geothermal conversation. And the numbers we're seeing out of our uh, drilling and tendering for Tohara uh, says to us that you know we're seeing gas price equivalents which are you know significantly south of five dollars a gigajoule. So obviously there's a connection here between the short term and the long term. If gas is going to be unreliable and more than six dollars a gigajoule, then we'll take control and we'll produce geothermal at significantly less than. $5 a gigajoule, and that will seal the fate of TCC. Uh, a few months to run on that, of course. Uh, the drilling's only just started, and we're expecting our responses from equipment manufacturers in November. So we should be able to update you on that in early 20. Um, the second leg of decarbonization, which is that demand growth, uh, I, I'm completely convinced that that will occur first with commercial and industrial customers and you saw the Transpower Process Heat report a few weeks ago and Simply Energy are just uh, you know well embedded with a lot of larger customers they have a great uh, capability uh, in the 20 odd people who work at Simply and I think that will accelerate that opportunity uh, for the country but importantly for contact at the front of that opportunity uh, and then finally just on this theme of decarbonisation and scale. Uh, clearly, we've proven something with broadband, which we now have to deliver uh, the fulfilment model behind for our customer base. But I think the work we've done so far tells us that uh, as convergence or consolidation occurs, we're pretty well placed. And the margins that are coming out of the competitive market tell you that that's probably worthy of acceleration. On to what does all of that turn into uh, for numbers? Uh, I mean, it's hardly a, you know, a, a fancy valedictory speech, uh, but it was exactly 12, four years ago today that Origin sold its uh, shares in contact. And within four years, I think we've proven that uh, we deliver on what we said we would deliver. Uh, the numbers there uh, are for your uh, models and your reading pleasure, uh, but tell you that we've delivered on the cash flow we said we would deliver, uh, we're delivering on the dividend we said we would deliver, uh, and as a present for my successor, I will point you to in the last four years our operating free cash flow sense per share was actually in the low 40s, uh, so a great foundation for the future. Uh, and. I hope as shareholders you see the clarity and the commitment we provide to these numbers. So with that we'll move to uh, questions and there'll be some technological process which Matthew will run. Uh, we'll go to the room first, uh, Matt needs some time. Uh, so unfortunately Mr. Great Swanepoel, uh, you're, you're not going to get the first questions. So in the room, a um, couple of questions uh, 
uh, Dennis and Dorian. Um, first of all, I guess in the past, I think if you talked about, I guess after the sale of Aharoa and um, uh, Rock Gas, it sort of indicated underlying EBITDAP was around about 480 mil. Uh, I'm just sort of seeing, I guess, the OPEX number is a little bit higher, um, and but obviously, I guess, it's somewhat by higher wholesale prices or down for that being significantly higher. So, I mean, where, where do you sort of see things now for FY20? Are you still around about that 480 or are we a little bit below? I mean, I think 480 is a good number. I mean, it's the $10 million of, you know, I won't say it's rounding because uh, it's more than a cent per share. Uh, but the whether OPEX comes in at the bottom or the top of the range, whether we get a bit of upside from wholesale volatility, uh, I don't think is that material. You know, we're pretty comfortable that, you know, fin year 20 is 480 and the free cash flow per share will be about 40 cents. You can you can do the maths yourself on that last page. It actually adds to a little over 41, 40 cents a share. Uh, we're pretty happy with 480. Uh, the, the reason why we don't get a lift because of increased wholesale prices is that in the uh, short to medium term, our fuel cost is gone up. So gas and carbon cost increase. And that's why we focus on Tohara, because although we talk about the switch from fossil fuels to renewables, it's also a very economic fuel cost switch. Uh, but yeah, long answer, 480 is okay for next year. Uh, doesn't assume any uh, upside from what wholesale volatility might do. And of course, normal caveats around hydrology. Yeah. Um, the second question was just around, uh, I mean, you haven't been in the CNI market um, for the last six months, largely due to those gas issues. Now that you do have gas largely contracted and things are looking, are, are you kind of looking getting back into that market? Or are you going to, you're, you're happy to stay in that CFD space for the next uh, year or so? I mean, the, the gas report has a contingent nature to it. So, you know, uh, we're not worried about that contingent nature, but our risk management would suggest to us we should stay out until it becomes non-contingent. Uh, but putting that aside, it actually looks uh, better to us to be in shorter term trading blocks. So spot and CFD actually looks better to us. Particularly with the lift in uh, the shoulders. You know, if, you know, a few years ago, it very much used to be a, you know, an exciting period based on hydrology going into winter. But now you're seeing, you know, shoulder periods, summer periods sitting quite high and, you know, with a, a hydrological tendency to summer, then, you know, they're, they're actually reasonably profitable relative to a, a full year fixed price commitment. And uh, I guess last question for me for now, at least, um, Chief Executive Replacement Process, how that's cracking? And the board only has two jobs, uh, affirm the strategy and hire and fire the CEO. Uh, so you've got to let them do that. Um, so they're in charge of it. And, you know, as they uh, announced in June, uh, they're undertaking a global search uh, along with internal assessments. I'm expecting that conclude that in the next month or two. Neville. <coughs> All right, uh, just pushing a little bit further on the uh, sort of portfolio perspective. Um, the gas you've secured sort of isn't really enough, uh, at least on my numbers, for all of Stratford, Tarapa, retail gas, and TCC to run hard. So I guess uh, focus just first of all on TCC. I mean, uh, in the numbers we've talked about here and in your outlook for the next sort of three to four years, possibly its remaining life, how hard do you expect it to generate? And how conditional is that on sort of gas contracts? You've answered your own question. Uh, yeah. In that, you know, there's always, you've got to look at the portfolio in quite a deconstructed way. You, you might look at annual numbers or, or daily numbers, but actually the need for gas is an hourly need. You know, it's the morning peak and the evening peak. You need to run them all at full noise. Uh, and gas storage clearly allows us to do a bit of shaping in that regard. Uh, well, you know, TCC has been running 300 megawatts peak and 170 megawatts off peak uh, since May. Uh, uh, and we expect that to be the, the, the pattern. Some of that has been under a tolling agreement. Uh, you know, we would expect some of that to continue as well, uh, just a, an efficiency. 
gas is less reliable and more expensive, then your know, plant efficiency actually is reasonably important. Uh, but yeah, it's chicken and egg. There is more, you know, there's not just the gas we've contracted, there are other conversations happening on uh, what gas uh, is out there. In, in terms of the reliability of those plants, um, obviously you know, TCC currently 65 megawatts derated, sort of extracted one out. Um, and all of this, uh, you mentioned earlier, sort of some of the unreliability about that. What's, what's your view on separately on the peakers, on their lifetime and reliability, but also uh, what's your thinking around TCC's reliability? And TCC's actually been pretty good since we got it going again in May, June at, at 300 megawatts. It wobbles a bit above 300 megawatts. Uh, we don't yet know whether that's a permanent uh, feature of the plan, but because we've not taken it out since we brought it back in in June, uh, May, June, uh, we, don't, we don't have an answer for that. I fully expect it'll go back up to 380. We just need a couple of weeks of an outage to uh, figure out why it's vibrating. Uh, on, on the peakers, you know, we, the outage is somewhat related to gas availability. You do more tidy of work to ensure longer term reliability. I'm not particularly worried about their longer term reliability. It'll be better than it won't be F190. And so, lastly, then on sort of gas cost, um, you know, and previously given us numbers of simply meter, think of numbers like six dollars and fifty a gigajoule gas. Uh, at least for the next, you know, two three years, also we've seen much higher numbers in the spot market. Um, up to today. Is, is that, that sort of range still sensible? Well, I mean, it's, it's again, it's chicken and egg. If it ain't 650, it ain't getting bought. Uh, you know, so it's it's just not economic above that uh, for us to buy the gas. Uh, and we are, you know, the conversations we're having are in that range. Uh, I think availability is the question. You know, and, and you know, you've seen this before on the Maui determination, you know, as soon as there's no gas available, there's gas available because the economics change. Uh, and that's some of the conversations we're having, you know, we're, we're the marginal buyer with the marginal plan. So, you know, have a little bit of control in that conversation. And the more we see at Tohara, it's less than five bucks a gigajoule. Great, thank you. Got a few more, but I'll, I'm sure I'm just going to ask those questions. So, okay. so we're going to go online, uh, and the first questions come from Mr. Brant Swanipoo. You just kicked me out. Am I on? Yeah. We can hear you now. Hi, Grant. Uh, fantastic. You guys kicked me out and then brought me back in again. Thank you. Um, morning, all. Uh, three broad questions. Uh, the first one just on the EBITDA. Um, you have on slide 34 a 480 million number that you're talking to. Can you just talk to the 7 million extra costs um, that's depicted there? Is that um, due to market making or what is it? That's right, Grant. It's, um, we're expecting to make less money on market making uh, next year. We're still expecting to make money, uh, but sort of three million as opposed to ten. Okay, and then if I just follow your um, guidance down from four eighty million, and then add the low and high on the different um, dividend making numbers from cash tax all the way through to um, EBIT. Um, I mean, stay in business capex. Um, for some reason, I'm getting a, um, a dividend expectation at 100% payout of 42 to 40 cents. Um, so your 39 cents doesn't quite stack up. Um, is there something above stay in business capex that you're putting in there that um, we're not aware of? No, I mean, it's, you know, the dividend policy grant has a degree of formulaic nature and a degree of subjectivity. Uh, and you never want to go backwards. Uh, and I'll look at the last four years, it's been above 40 cents. So it's, you know, being able to deliver comfortably and not surprise. But you're right, your maps didn't get you to over 40 cents. 
Oh, thank you. And then just on doing away with the prompt payment discount, um, is that going to have um, the similar sort of effect that we've seen on your competitors? You know, around about three to five million of impact. Uh, this is why you know I was a little bit uh, animated about it earlier uh, last year when it started to be removed, uh, because done in a good way, it's actually good for customers because it's simpler. It improves the uh, operations of contact because we're not having to deal with complex structures and we're actually seeing it being net positive so you know in, in a perverse way you know the door-to-door -door sales people are finding it hard to sell the basic plan because it's easy and you know some of that conversation relies on describing complexity our digital take-up of basic plan has been really high because customers see how easy it is to do price comparisons. Uh, along with the payment methods, the, the, the products per customer, we're now at 1.33 products per customer. I put all of that together and say, it's actually net neutral, maybe even a bit positive. But it's at the net level, not the gross margin level where that shows itself. Wow. Um, and my final question, um, just on broadband, it seems to be going phenomenally well. I think you were adding 1,500 customers a month. You had 12,000 already. Um, are you expecting this sort of trend to continue in the near term? And then have you moved off uh, Vocus directly with Chorus now? And that's where some of the uh, margin improvement will lead to a profitable FY20 from that product? Uh, yes, and nearly. Um, okay. The the service costs that we've been experiencing with broadband is the lack of vis visibility of the customer journey. Uh, so if you go to a wholesaler who looks after everything for you, you don't get to see what's going on for the customer. Uh, and that's resulted in a lot of calls and a bit of cost. And I would expect over the next few months, subject to some commercial negotiations, for that to change, which will deliver a better customer experience but also lower cost of fulfillment. That's probably a month or two away. And the, the current run rate has continued in terms of um, capture? Yeah, we're at about 1,000 a month. Um, Fantastic. Well, thanks. That's all from me. Thanks so much for giving me a chance to ask questions again. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. See you later. Yeah, bye. Who's next, Matthew? It's Aaron is on the line, let's just promote him to... Hi Aaron, you can go. Um, I uh, had two questions, if I may, uh, very straightforward and simple ones. So first of all, just on your little bridge that uh, Grant just mentioned, uh, you have 10 million there on recovery of um, wholesale prices uh, and I'm, I'm just curious to probe a little bit uh, it seems um, awfully conservative I must say particularly in light of your earlier comment that you would focus on the CFD market um, which seems very prudent in my view in light of the uh, different pricing so as far as I can see you know I struggle to see how you could sell uh, anywhere in the wholesale CFD, CNI market for only $3 more per megawatt, which is what I get to for your CNI book. So I just wanted to try to understand that. Thank you. Yeah, this, um, this mainly actually relates to the retail market. The, what we're assuming is uh, we've had some uh, higher short-term CFD pricing and some higher pricing on length in FY19. Uh, which isn't going to repeat to the same degree because wholesale pricing, whilst they're expected to remain high in FY20, they are, it is expected to reduce relative to um, the prices that we saw in, in FY19. So um, what we're seeing is we increase our tariffs uh, to the retail customers, so that comes through, which is good, what you're seeing there in terms of the 10. We'll start to get some value uh, around CNI because we will start to recontract some of that stuff and reprice it. So you'll see the price gap in CNI. But what you'll see is uh, what we're expecting is whilst um, uh, short term CFD is still going to be relatively good value, it, we're not going to get the same level of pricing in FY20 as we were able to achieve in, 
in F point on T. But but sorry if I could just probe and, and refer back to slide eighteen then a little bit. Uh, because you know I'm not sure you seem to be getting 74, 73 or something like that for CFD on average. And I know there's some long-term contracts in there. Uh, and then around 82 for CNI. So if your 10 million is referring to customer, do you not then expect anything above that level uh, for FY20? We're expecting the, the things to offset, basically. Okay. I guess uh, I'll, I'll have to ex accept that. Um, Sorry, Aaron, there's also, a, you know, you focused on the price, but it's a price times quantity question as well. And, you know, we often talk about our risk management practices, but in very simple terms, we avoid being short in July and August when it's freezing and there's no hydro. Uh, so that does limit the quantity you can sell. Uh, and you know that's a fuel question, and that's the that's that's the constraint at the moment. If that wasn't constrained, then it'd be no problem. But then, if it wasn't constrained, you wouldn't have those prices. Yeah, because because Aaron, the other element is that one hundred and forty-two dollars per megawatt that we were getting on the left with the with the grid as well. That that's obviously not gonna. We're not expecting that to continue uh, at the same level into FY twenty. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I thought there was a sort of gross number here. That's how, how I read the chart, but uh, yeah, we can take that offline. Uh, my my second um, question was uh, just on your comments on Tauhara and uh, your five versus 650, etc. implied gigajoule cost. And I guess, Dennis, this is sort of a sort of bigger picture question. If I look at the stability of the New Zealand uh, electricity market overall, uh, you know, the gas and the, even the fact that you do have sort of incremental and somewhat unreliable gas supplies at times is sort of crucial to, in my book, uh, to provide some sort of stability around prices. So I'm just curious how you think about Tahara and, uh, you know, if you replace you, basically your, your entire gas book with Tahara, how you see the stability of pricing in, in the whole New Zealand wholesale market? Well, I think it, it the nature changes and that's what we're obviously seeing with the reduction in uh, flexible uh, thermal plant with the replacement of must-run renewables. So Tohara in, in, in average terms is a very simple decision, you know, depending on what heat rate you assume and whether you assume whack or hurdle returns, you know, the fuel replacement cost is four to five dollars a gigajoule. But of course you take out a 300 plus megawatt plant and replace it with, let's say a 120 or 140 megawatt plant, then you do drive a little bit more volatility into the, uh, uh, the tighter periods. And I think that's a feature going forward. and. One of the things that will puzzle us prior to the investment decision on Tohara is how we make sure that that all happens in a smooth way. Uh, so what's the capacity support for more renewables and how do we think about that is probably the outstanding question. It's good to see TOTS sign into gas storage because that gives you some comfort that Junction Road is real. Uh, and, and I think there'll just be more of that. Aaron will, you know, and TCC or the rankings will be the next Otahu in the list of plants that close and get replaced by renewables. Uh, but clearly, uh, as an integrated player, uh, we've maintained uh, some stability in prices for consumers. Uh, and some of that's been driven by the competitive market, of course. So. I, I get your question, but I think we're going to have a few years of volatility, actually, as this transition continues to occur. Okay, thank you. I'll settle with that. Thank you. Are there any other questions on the line? If you have a question, please, can you raise your hand using the function at the bottom of the screen? It'd be quite good to have a mute button for people all of the time, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no more questions. Uh, with that, we'll 
Let you get on with your day. Oh, Neville's got another one. <laughs> another one? You sound mute. surprised. Put Neville on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and it's really just in respect of the guidance for operating costs. So had a more aggressive sort of cost out guidance skip by 20 in the previous pack. I'm wondering, um, should we still think the trajectory is, is the same as you talked about in the past, uh, respective of the by 20 guidance? Yeah, I think the the business is now seeing it as a normal activity to take out a few percent a year. Uh, and as Dorian referred to it, good quality uh, cost reductions. Uh, there was always going to be a bit of a path to it. Uh, I think unlike most of our competitors, at least it's a downward trajectory. Uh, there's just a few more things to do this year than we expected when we you know, gave that guidance as probably as far back as 18 months ago. But the trajectory is the same. So 185 to 195 for the year after or year after that? Yeah, yeah still. Yeah, still. Yeah. So, and the reality is, you know, you, you're always playing a, not playing, but is it, there's only so many people to do things. So you can't look at OPEX without looking at CAPEX. Uh, and if we were, uh, to pull the trigger on Tohara, you probably expect SIB CapEx to come down because there's only so many engineers <laughs> to do so many things. So there is an interrelationship between the two. One of the things that, you know, we're still puzzling through as well and, you know, it's getting clearer. In, in digital retailing, what's CapEx and what's OPEX is becoming increasingly academic because your capital spend is on technology that's almost disposable. So, you know, we do go for the, the Totex number uh, and the trajectory is as we've previously described, but you know, it might be six or 12 months later. So in the same vein, the uh, staying business CapEx guidance beyond the FY20. If, you know, if we're used to talking, I think numbers, correct me if I'm wrong, 60 to 65, we still have that in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the only thing that excludes is uh, any Wairaki consenting costs. Yeah. And that will vary depending on whether we're doing any wells and that sort of stuff okay, to do with TCC. Yeah, only one more, I promise. Uh, TCC, if you remove that, uh, no longer need it, it's sort of two or three years, what uh, is the OPEX cost reduction? Um, eight, eight million dollars, roughly. Yeah. Sorry, that 60 to 65 is now 55 to 60. Thank you. In the, uh, you know, uh, TCC, I mean, most of the impact would be non cash on its closure. Uh, but as you saw with Otaha, you do get uh, cash tax benefits if you close it. So, yeah, the, the sum of things to think about with TCC is uh, the non cash write down, but that would probably be through the accelerated depreciation methodology. Uh, OPEX down by 8 million a year, but in the year you abandon it, you do get a uh, cash tax benefit. So if you look at, you know, five or seven year cash flows, cash tax is actually reasonable and material in the decision. Um, from a cash, uh, sorry, from a tax perspective, what's on the books at the moment? About one farter written down tax value. Unlike Otahu, we're unlikely to be able to sell the land for $40 million. Yeah. Or anything. Thank you. All right, uh, no more questions have emerged online. So uh, thank you all for your attention. We'll see you, uh, most of you, or all of you, uh, through the next few days. Thank you. Thank you.